I want to thank uh, Tom Miner for joining us for a discussion around leadership. And uh, we're going to cover a whole range of topics like we have been throughout all of the interviews that we've been doing. Tom, first of all, welcome. Thank you for thank taking, you. taking some time. And can you just tell us a little bit about who you are, what your background is, and, and then we'll go sure. from there. I live in Washington State, born and raised here. And uh, I worked for the Pierce County Sheriff's Department from 1977 to 2003. I retired as a major. I was in charge of uh, all patrol activities in Pierce County that were not part of an incorporated uh, city, and that included uh, patrol uh, investigations, search and rescue, and special operations. In uh, 1992, I became involved through my search and rescue connection with the National Urban Search and Rescue System. And so from 1992 until 2003, that was a, it was a federally assisted program, but after 9-11, it became a fully federally funded program. So I left the Sheriff's Department in 2003 to become the full-time program manager for the Washington Urban Search and Rescue Task Force. And so from uh, 2003 till 2015, I was uh, full-time employed responding to disasters. And from 2010 till 2015, I was one of three federal incident uh, management team leaders responding to multiple disasters throughout the United States. Probably have 30 to 35 different disasters that I've responded to and been a part of the uh, management team trying to coordinate assistance to local authorities. But who's counting? Yeah. <laughs> I lost and, count. And it's that exact experience or experiences that I think we can draw upon because correct me if I'm wrong, but there are common themes throughout whether, you know, over those 30 plus kind of incidents. And so that's exactly what we're going to be drawing upon and helping corporate America, corporate Canada. We can unpack that and, and maybe help them out, particularly during this period of time. So Tom, yeah, really didn't, particular event. It really or, didn't matter what, uh, what the disaster was, the, the problems and the issues were always pretty much the same. And different people were forced to make tough decisions with limited information. So those were always the environments that I went into, regardless of the nature of the event. Yeah. And we just talked a little bit off camera about that need to control the inside and, and your own emotions and your own thoughts and securities and all of those other things. So is there a particular incident or event that you could talk about where I guess any one of them would have the same common themes, but is there anything that would come to mind with regard to how that could help people that are watching this now to really uh, crystallize the experiences that you've had? Yeah. Most of the time I was responding to strangers. I was going to another community and a, an environment that had been impacted and it, it wasn't it wasn't my community. It wasn't the people that I knew. And so it was easier to be somewhat detached from those events and just focus on the issues at hand and try to help the community get uh, organized and refocused to what needed to be done. But uh, I was the inc federal incident commander for the Oso landslide that occurred here in Washington State, uh, I think in 2014. And in that particular case, it became very personal because uh, the people, I did, though I didn't know any of the victims, I knew all of the responders. I had worked with the, the county responders and the state responders here in Washington State most of my career. And they knew me. And uh, so it became very different in that sense and uh, was much more emotional than many of the other disasters that I'd been to, which again, I could detach myself from because I didn't know the people. So this current situation is you're dealing with your own communities. You're dealing with uh, your own workers and trying to <clears throat> solve their immediate problems. And so it's very similar to that, I would think. So when, so let's take the young Tom, I get it. You're still very young, but younger, <laughs> how about the younger Tom? Okay. What, so you're just stepping into whether it be into the HUSAR program or whatever time frame you want to go into, what was the, the younger Tom thinking as a leader? What were the emotions or feelings and 
what were you trying to do when you were a young leader? And then we'll contrast that with the Tom of today and, and let's see if there's a, a difference. So what, walk us through the younger a, Tom back in the day. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. I think the Tom was more focused at, at doing uh, type A personality, getting the job done. And it was very hard back then to not be hands-on, not be the doer. So a lot of my early activities were uh, the actual physical rescue at, in, at the local level and being out in the front line leading a team but uh, to, or teaching the skills so that others could do it as effectively. And over time, I realized that I was more effective at organizing and managing other people and letting other people do the work with direction. And it was much more effective and much more satisfying as I got older to watch the results of other people become successful with good direction because they were floundering without direction. And I, I felt, I found my, uh, my best role was, was getting people going in the same direction and uh, reaching the same goals through good coordination and direction. So when you're, because you talked about that type A personality and wanting to do that. So what would you tell people that are new leaders, whether it be in emergency services, but more specifically in this context, corporate America, corporate Canada, because I think that's a pretty normal reaction, right? To want to do, do, do. But so what would you tell them when they're in that same situation? Because you're also leading people typically with more experience than you, older than you. You don't have a lot of street cred typically. Can you walk us through what that might look like as, as a young leader? If you were looking back and you had younger Tom, hey man, let's have a seat. Let's go for coffee. This is what I, this is the kind of guidance I'd give you. What would you tell um, them? Uh, surround yourself with good people. Surround yourself with, and, and educate yourself is by listening to the older, more senior people. Get their, take their advice but recognize that you're the one that ultimately has to uh, take the lead and give direction, but don't do it in a vacuum. And then delegate tasks to people that you trust, uh, people that are most capable, give them the, the tasking to do the work and get out of their way and just from the background, support their efforts, make sure they have the tools, the resources, the authority to get things done that you've directed. And don't yeah. try to micromanage what they're doing. Yes, you might do it differently. Yes, you might think you can do it better, but you can't. Once you start doing something as a leader, your focus becomes that thing. And then you lose the big picture. As a leader, you have to focus on the big picture. What's working, what's not working. Pay attention to the things that aren't working and encourage the things that are working. Because I, and the reason I asked that is because I remember when I was a young leader, I was always trying to prove myself. And I always thought of it, and I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on this. I always thought of it as good. I'm in charge now. Thank goodness. And I get to tell people what to do. And it was always about me, which was a very, looking back, selfish and very immature way of looking at it. But did you also feel that when you were just starting? To some degree, but I think I've always had the attitude that I can get more accomplished through the work of others with, with good direction. And that I've always empowered my subordinates to make decisions and to, to lean forward. And people would come to me as when I was a sergeant and say, Hey, Sarge, I've got this problem. What should I do? I says, what do you want to do? What's your plan? Okay. Sounds like a good plan. Go forth and do it. So I, I would tell people, don't come to me for solutions. Come to me with a plan. And if it's a good plan, we'll carry it out. And if it's not, we'll work on it. But, but 
make a decision. Don't wait for me to make the decision for you. So I've always empowered people to do that. And I've always encouraged people to uh, not be afraid of making a mistake. I'm not going to, I'm not going to crucify somebody for making a mistake if they made a decision because that's an opportunity to learn. What did we learn from that action that didn't work out? How can we do better the next time? Yeah, I often see that as a big obstacle when people talk about delegating and empowering others. It's this control issue that I'm going to lose control and who knows, it's going to be chaos and all of those other things. And now as we we see maybe a, a pretty seismic shift in how potentially we're doing business now with remote workplaces and things like that. With all of your experience going from, we would call it a centralized decision-making model to a decentralized, what kind of guidance would you give to those kind of managers that are typically used to calling a team meeting, going into the boardroom and saying, all right, this is what we need to do. How do you, what advice or guidance would you give to them? Because now they're working over Zoom or whatever, and there's probably a lot of fear about, man, how am I going to still lead and manage people remotely? So what kind of guidance could you give to them? You're going to have to look at your normal day-to-day uh, business model and scrap it. Because in it, it, and that's what happens in disasters. That's what's happening in our current situation is we're seeing systems, regulations, rules at all levels of business and government hindering response. And people seeking approval for things that need to happen now. And they can't wait days, weeks, or hours for those decisions to be made. So you really have to look at your organization and go, what's, what's preventing us from being successful today? And let people know that they have the authority to override existing policy and procedures, have those discussions with folks and do what you need to do to take care of employees, people, stakeholders within whatever the organization is now. We will stay in communication, but when you can't reach out because of technology limitations or the inability to get all the decision makers together, empower people to make a decision that's in the best interest of the organization and the people that, that work for you or that you're working for. And I think that's one of the greatest contrasts between say emergency services and corporate in that emergency services, we're used to, we're comfortable making decisions without all of the information. Like that's just part of the gig. And in you fact, will, you will I've never often, have all the information. No. And that, and that's just it. And, and in fact, I often think if I do think I know everything I'm wrong. And so what, like, how do you get comfortable making decisions without all the information? Cause that's just inherently like, that's fearful for people that aren't used to having consensus and meetings and all those other things. Like how do you, how did you get comfortable making those decisions? I'm not sure you ever get totally comfortable. You just have to recognize that you, you gather as much information as you can that's available. You can only be held, it's a legal standard, but you can only be held legally responsible for your decisions based on what you knew at the time. And so, you know, what I know tomorrow might change my decision and be willing to change your course of action when you get more information. But based on what you know right now, make a decision and be comfortable with the fact that it may change tomorrow based on, on new additional information and learn from the actions that you take. What I also tell people is no decision that you are going to make, no matter how much information you have, will not have an adverse effect on somebody. Every decision made, no matter how in depth, no matter how educated, is gonna affect somebody adversely. And you're seeing many decisions being made across this country, which no matter what the intention is, no matter how much information they have, adversely affects many of us. 
Mm-hmm. It's, it's just what it is. Understand that that's going to happen. And then you start putting plans in place to help those people that it's adversely affecting. And so I guess that's part of the quote unquote bigger paycheck, right? The responsibility or burden of leadership. And with that in mind, what do you think people are looking for in their leader, not only during crisis, but what about just in general? So if you were to say, what is that archetypal leader? What, what are they looking for in your own experience? So when you go to an event, how are you trying to be as a leader? Um, first off, I try to give people this, I've got a, a leadership, t- I've got a team that comes with me. So I'm not going to these things by myself. I have a team. And the first thing we do is we, we sit down as a team and we lay out, why are we here? What's, what are we trying to accomplish? What are our goals and objectives for the next operational period, whether that's today, the next hour, the next day, or the next week? What are we trying to accomplish? And take it a, a, a bite at a time, usually, usually at a day at a time. And so that everybody on that team knows what we're trying. Here's our goals. Here's what we're trying to accomplish. And everybody should be marching, doing something towards achieving those goals. And then... a a clear understanding of who's responsible for what, what the reporting chain is or isn't, and what their authorities are. So a a clear understanding up front. And then I stand back and watch and listen. And what I tell people, my my position in an organization is stand around with my one hand in my pocket and one hand with a cup of coffee. It may not have anything in it, but it's gonna be a cup in the other hand. Because I should never as a leader be doing because what happens when you start doing something, you lose focus. So I'm listening to conversations. I'm watching people work and I'm watching for them to get frustrated and I'm watching for their voices to change. And that's when I walk over and say, what's up? How can I help? What's frustrating you at this moment in time? Why can't you get your part of the task accomplished? And then my job is to solve whatever is causing that frustration and to resolve whatever conflict is going on and then step away and let them continue to do their job. And so that's how I manage people. You nailed it because I think as leaders, there's this badge of honor that if I'm not running around like a chicken with my head cut off, I'm not being valuable, I'm not doing my job. But I agree with you, like I would rather walk into a situation and in fact, the leader, the manager, whoever, they're a very good litmus test for how this thing is going. Because if a leader is walking around and coffee and hand in the pocket, one of two things, they're either blissfully detached from what's going on, (laughs) which I've also come across. But the other side is leadership presence. And I think that's a big thing. And, And I've spoken a lot about the emotions of leadership. And so Speak about that in terms of the leader's role in establishing what is that culture emotionally or energetically of a team, because the contrast is nice and calm, cool and collected, but then the other one is absolutely frenetic. So it sounds like you're choosing the calm, cool and collected. So why is that? And and what's the benefit of having a leader that's that way versus say the one that's running around like crazy? I I think it just... it evokes a air of professionalism, confidence, and competence to the people you're there to try to help. When I walk into a community that's been devastated by, by an event, whether it's a hurricane or tornado uh, uh, or a terrorist event, um, they're victims. They, just like we all are right now, they're victims and they're emotionally impacted by what's going on around them. I'm coming in as an outsider. And first of all, I have to ingratiate myself with Mm -hmm. the people that I'm there to assist with. And the only way I can do that is to be somewhat detached, have an air of confidence and sit back and say, how can we help? We're here to help you. What's your biggest issues? How can I help you right now? Here's what I can do for you. Here are the things that, that I bring with me. This is why I'm here. And when you've got a minute, I'll be over there. It, it, when you have a minute, let's talk and talk about how we can take some of this pressure off of you. So it's, if I came in with my hair on fire, they're already dealing with people left and right with that very 
issue for good reasons. I, I don't, when I come in to assist somebody, I need to come in calm, cool and collected and just let them know why I'm there, what I can do to assist. So that over time, I just found that that's the, the most effective way of, of doing things in my staff or my, the people that work for me over the years uh, seem to appreciate that approach and knowing that I trusted them to do their job. All I had to do is give them direction. And, and the, the best thing ever is I would walk over to my, my logistics chief on my team and say, hey, are you aware of the problem out at such and such a look? Yep, yep, we're on it, boss, we've got it. So even though I became aware of it, what I always loved was my staff was one step ahead of me at almost every turn. They were almost always dealing with the issue already. They had, didn't have to come to me and say, hey, we need help with this. If they did, that, it wasn't a surprise to me. I usually knew they were dealing with it. And if they couldn't solve it, they would come to me for help. Rarely was I ever surprised and, or, or surprised one of my subordinates with something that they weren't already aware of and working on. And so that's and a sign so of a good team. How do you create that, Tom? Because I, I experienced that as well. High-performing teams are, are teams that operate, they're self-correcting and they don't need a lot of guidance necessarily. But from your perspective, telling somebody in you know, corporate America, corporate Canada, like how do you create a team that's proactive and, and not looking to you to be making directions all the time? Because we see that a lot where they just yeah. get paralyzed and then they're looking up at the manager and the leader say, what would you like us to do? H how do you create a team like that? That is a really tough question. I, I, I was blessed in that I had people on my team from all over the United States. In fact, as the young Tom Miner, it used to be, what am I doing here? I am surrounded by experts at all levels. And am I really qualified to be here? But it, it became pretty obvious to me early on that my skills and my experience I held me in good stead with other people at all, all levels from New York City and LA and Florida and other big metropolitan areas. I had as much experience as they did in a wide variety of, of things and uh, skills and knowledge, it, but it was, it was leadership. It was just trusting those people, getting them together, sitting down with them, talking about how we were going to operate. And I think that's what's important right now is CEOs and executives <clears throat> need to sit down with their, their trusted team members, people that they obviously hired because they were, they had confidence in them. They moved them up in their hierarchy because they had confidence in them and setting down the new, the new dynamics. This is the world we're in today. This is how we're going to operate. These are our current goals and objectives, uh, which is hopefully let's take care of our employees. Let's do the right things to keep them healthy and keep them solvent. And with the bottom line of making sure that our business or our organization can ste step right back in when this is over and go back to work. Those would be the basic goals that I would try to set up right now, no matter what my business was, mm -hmm. is take care of the people, take care of the business, make sure we're viable. Those are our goals. Those are our objectives. How do we do it? 